Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Ezra. We come today to Ezra chapter 7, and we resume our study in verse number 1. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is a place where you can study any book of the Bible anytime you want. Or you can begin in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, and go all the way through the book of Revelation. However you want to do it, it's just important that you do it. It's just important that you study the Word of God, because it's what God wants us to do. He wants us to draw closer to Him. He wants our faith to be strengthened. He wants our holiness to increase. And the best way to do those things is to spend time with Him in the Word of God. You know, I never study the Word of God to get a message. I never study the Word of God to get a sermon. Never. I don't think I ever have. I just study the Word of God to have fellowship with Jesus, and then I give you the overflow. It's a relationship thing, and that's what I want with that's what I want for you and Jesus. A relationship. And so I teach the Word of God verse by verse right now in the book of Ezra and also, again, at your pace, your convenience at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Father, today we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Zariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah. Now, we're not going to read all these names and his genealogy. I do want to say this, though, before we move down to verse 6. In the previous chapters, In this book, we looked at the initial return of the Israelites to the Holy Land after their 70-year captivity. And this chapter, though, is the second record. It is the record, I should say, of the second wave of people who returned to Israel. And this second return was led by the man that we are introduced to here in verse 1. And by the man whose name this book is named after, Ezra. He's a priest. So after stating his genealogy, let's move down to verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So it was Ezra was a man, he was a ready scribe, which means that he really knew the word of God. But he didn't just know it, he lived it. And so he could teach it. You can't effectively teach the word of God unless you live the word of God. It's going to be stale. It's going to be like a book report. You, might, you can communicate facts, but it's lifeless and it's stale. The most effective Bible teachers are those who truly love Jesus Christ, who live for him, who are prayed up, and confess immediately when they fail. Because they are anointed with power. They not only know the truth and teach the truth, they live it. And so it says in verse 7, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanim, unto Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. King Artaxerxes was the grandson of King Darius, who we were introduced to earlier at the beginning of this book, king of Persia. 8. And he came to Jerusalem, talking about Ezra, in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. 
And upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. His journey was about a thousand miles, and it took four months. But he made it because the good hand of God was with him. The good hand of God isn't with us. It doesn't matter how determined we might be. It doesn't matter what talents and skills we may have. We can't do nothing. We can't do anything, I should say, unless the good hand of God is with us. The Bible says that a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him by the Father. Verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and ordinances. He was a good man. He was a man that any preacher could pattern themselves after. If you're looking for a human being to pattern yourself after, he would be a good one. Ezra returned to Israel, but he didn't do it for the fun of it. I mean, he didn't do it for kicks. He knew that the people there needed a steady diet of God's word, and he was determined to get to Israel in order to teach the word of God to those people. They desperately needed the Word of God. People desperately need the Word of God today, too. I'm, I'm just afraid that we are living in a day when, at least in this country, in America, there aren't really a whole lot of people that want to hear the Word of God. They want to hear portions of it, but not all of it, not the stuff that makes them uncomfortable. Those people don't listen to me. Oh, they might listen to me for a couple of seconds or a program, but they turn it off. And they don't want to come back. Because I'm too straightforward. And they're not, they're not used to hearing the good and the bad, the promises, the warnings, and everything else that's in the Word of God. We're living... In a day, I think, where there's a real famine for God's Word, as the Word of God speaks, speaks of, a famine of God's Word. And I'm afraid that there are way too many preachers and pastors and Bible teachers who don't communicate the Word of God the way it should be because people don't want it. Ezra, if, if, there would, if no one would listen to him, he would have still proclaimed the word of God. And that's the attitude that should be there with any man of God who is called by God to teach the word. So he came back to Israel for one reason, to teach the word of God. Verse 11, now this is the copy of the letter that the king, Artaxerxes, gave unto Ezra, the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Ezra needed permission from the king to return home. And this is a letter granting him that permission. Remember, Israelite was still ruled by the Persians. They're heading home but they're still under the umbrella of the Persians. 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, here's, the, here's the, the letter, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. The Persian king is called king of kings, and that's because he's the most powerful man in the world. Persia, Persia is the big world power. They are the second huge world power. They followed Babylon. 
They are the second of four major world powers that will rule the world in the times of the Gentiles. Verse 13. The letter continues. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm who are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem go with thee. There were those who, of course we have seen this in previous broadcasts, they didn't want the Israelites to return. But they better not try to stop them now. No one is forced to return, but if they want to, they can. And if you stand in their way, you're going to be opposing the king. And you want to do that. Verse 14, For as much as thou art sent by the king and by his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand, Ezra wanted to go to Israel, as I mentioned, to teach the word of God. The king wanted him to go in order to check on those who had already returned. 15. And to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find and all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the people and of the priest, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. The king gave a lot of wealth in silver and gold because he believed that it was the right thing to do. He believed in the God of Israel, and therefore he wanted to please him. And so he gave. It's exactly what Jesus meant when he said, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is also. Just look at the king's checkbook. And you could see that he had a heart for God. Look at his bank statement. Take a look at your bank statement. And you will find out what your priorities are. What we spend our money on is a barometer of our priorities. You'll know very quickly if your priority is to get out the Word of God or help get out the Word of God, if your priority is Jesus, or if it's the things of this world. Doesn't it scare you a little bit when you think of the fact that you're going to stand before Jesus. And I'm talking to you if you're a Christian. You're going to stand before Jesus and give an account of how you spent your time and what we're talking about here, how you spent your money. You know, you have a bank statement, but God has everything written down, as it were. Not just where we gave our money and how we spent our money, but what we did with the minutes, the most precious gift next to salvation that God has given us, in my opinion, and the Word of God, are the minutes that he has given us to serve him. And he keeps a record of how we spent them. Isn't it a little sobering to you to know that God is keeping track? And at the judgment seat of Christ, although you will not be judged for your sin because they were put on Christ on the cross if you're a Christian. And yet, there's going to be sadness initially when we see the time that we wasted doing bad when we could have been doing good and all the good that could have been if we had been more dedicated to Jesus, more consistent in our walk with the Lord. And when we take a look at how we spent our money, perhaps, it's a sobering thought, and it's a good one to think. And I think we should keep it in mind so that we make the right decisions. 
in light of eternity. And here you got King. He was just, I mean, the decisions that he made, where he spent his money, was an indicator that he had a heart for God. 17, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money, bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meal offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. The king wanted the God of heaven to be worshipped in the proper way with the proper sacrifices. 18. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold that do <clears throat> after the will of your God. The king trusted Ezra. I mean, he was no expert in the Jewish religion. He was no expert in the God of Israel. But he knew that Ezra was. And he knew that Ezra would do whatever God wanted him to do. So he gave him the means to do it. 19. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. <clears throat> they found holy vessels that Babylon had carried out of the Jewish temple some 70 some years earlier when they conquered Israel, and those holy vessels were to be returned to the house of God. And truly, the good hand of God was upon them. God moved the hearts of the Persian king, the heart of the Persian king, to help Israel because it was God's will for them to return. See, God is not, God is not uh, hindered by the attitudes of man or the things of this world. The things that hinder man do not hinder God. He can just change things. And one of the beautiful things I think about the Word of God is that he stands by his Word to perform it. Oh, it's true because it's true. And when God says something's going to happen, like Israel, you're going back to Israel after a 70-year captivity, it's going to happen because God said it. See? And God's Word does not come back to him void. But it also happens because God stands by his word to perform it. He not only states his word, he performs his word. And no one can stop him. Verse 20. And whatever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. Talk about trust. And as I mentioned, Israel was under the control of Persia, the world empire. Persia had a local treasury in Israel, though. And Ezra is free to use as much of the money out of that local treasury as he needs <clears throat> to perform the will of God. That king sure did trust him, didn't he? He trusted Ezra because he knew Ezra did the right thing because he was a man of God. You didn't have to stand behind Ezra and watch everything that he did to make sure that he did it right. He was a man of character because he had a fear, a respect, and a love for God. A Christian man should never marry a woman who doesn't love Jesus. If, if a woman loves Jesus, and the flip side is true too, if a man loves Jesus, you can trust them. You don't have to worry about them. They'll do the right thing. They won't be unfaithful to you. They won't hurt you when you're not around, do things that you don't like. People who love God and love Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit are people of character. They do the right thing when given the opportunity. And no one has to watch them. The king may not have been saved. 
but he knew that he could trust a saved man. 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers, which are beyond the river, that whatever Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. Unto an hundred talents of silver, and to a hundred measures of wheat, and to an hundred baths of wine, and to a hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. So those who were in charge of the local treasury, Persia's local treasury in Israel, were not to give Ezra a hard time, but simply give him anything that he needed. 23. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his son? King Ahasuerus was a smart man. He knew he was the most powerful man on earth, which is why he called himself king of kings, because Persia had conquered the world, basically. <clears throat> so he truly was king of kings in that sense. But he had a king. He had a ruler who was far more powerful than he was, and that's God. And he wouldn't do anything to upset God. He said, why should we bring trouble on ourselves by not doing what is right in the eyes of God? I don't know. Be nice if we could bottle that attitude and take a drink of it every day and live it out. I know we know that if we're saved, that we want to please God if we're saved. We want to do what is right because we love Jesus. And secondarily, we want to do what is right because we know God chastens his wayward children. And yet, even with that, we sometimes fail. We sometimes sin. That's why it's so important to repent and confess. Why, why bring trouble on yourself? By forcing the hand of God, as it were, to chasten you for disobedience, for rebellion. So the king definitely wanted to be on the Lord's side. Verse 24. Also we inform you that, touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, Nethamim, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. The king wanted to teach the civil leaders the word of God so that their laws would be in line with the Holy Bible. Again, out of respect for God. Knowing that the right way to do things will bring blessing from God if we perform them. 26. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. Now see, this is a leader. A leader is not afraid to rock the boat in order to do the right thing and to make sure that everyone is doing the right thing. There are some people who should not be in the place of leadership. At work, in government, in the ministry, in the church, they should not be leaders. Because they allow people who do bad things to continue to do them. 
and they turn a blind eye to it. And if somebody is teaching the wrong thing, they won't confront it. In some perverted definition of love. You know, this is a problem that Britain had in dealing with Hitler. You know, Nepal's Chamberlain, he wanted peace. He didn't want he didn't want anything to rock the boat, so he just let Hitler do what he wanted. And he got stronger and stronger until it got to the point where we had to be involved in World War II. If you're going to be a leader, you have to take a stand against anyone or anything that threatens truth, that th threatens what is correct in the realm of your jurisdiction. You have to take a stand. This is why parents need to take a stand against anyone or anything that is a threat to their family. And you know what? Some people involved may not like it, but that's okay. Let them not like it. You have to guard what you have authority over and make sure that nothing hurts it. And again, that's true on any level. And so the king, he said, no, we're not going to allow anything. And I don't want you leaders back in Israel to allow anything that God doesn't like. Can't do that. Just can't do that. Again, 26, whosoever will not do the law of God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. It doesn't matter. The king laid down some guidelines for the punishing of those who break God's law. He laid down the guidelines and, and he trusted Ezra to enforce the exact punishment which would be just. See, he wanted to please God. You can't have God's blessing if you don't please God. That's why as a leader, you have to do what is right and take a stand. And by the way, when you take a stand against those who do wrong, you're not rocking the boat. They're rocking the boat. You're trying to stop the boat from rocking by putting a stop to them or getting rid of them, whatever the case. Whatever needs to be done, you need to do it. 27, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Everything seems to be going well and Ezra knows why. It's because God is blessing their efforts to return home. 28, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes and I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. So the king allowing Ezra and the people to return was a blessing. And the king trusting Ezra with Persia's treasury in Israel. I tell you, that was, a, that was an act of God. It was a, it was a miracle. And Ezra knew it. So, God is blessing. Obey God so that he can bless you. And when you fail, confess immediately. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. You can do that at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please do that. Check it out. Begin a study of God's word, verse by verse, going through the Bible using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. And when you're there and when you're studying the word of God, please remember that if the Word of God is a blessing to you, we are brought to you. This ministry exists by your prayers and financial support. I need partners to stand with me because this has been a faith ministry for over 30 years. A lot of Christians won't stand with me, so-called Christians, because I teach the Word of God. And so I depend on those who love God's Word, the faithful remnant. And you can give and Right there at thebibleversebyverse.com, just click the donate button and give us the Lord may lead. So long, everyone.